Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining our Sencorp Charcoals live event today. My name is Lynn Larkowski. I'm the Sencorp Division Manager here at Sencorp White. Today we have presenting Julie Griswold. She's the Sales and Marketing Director of Charcoals. And John Benker who is our Tooling Manager here at Sencorp White. Uh, together, they have over 50 years of experience in the trimming industry. Feel free to submit any questions and just know that the panel will get back to you and follow up after the event. And now without any further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Julie and John. Hi, John. Hi. <laughs> I'm John Banker. I'm the tooling manager here at Sencord. I've been here for about 30 years, and uh, we've had a uh, great relationship with Sharples. Uh, they produce some uh, phenomenal uh, trim tools. We've uh, appreciated their knowledge in the in the thermal forming industry, specifically for trimming thermal form parts, and uh, it has worked uh, very well for uh, both parties. Thank you. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. um, yes, um, I'm from Shopples and we're a commercial dye shop. We service uh, many thermal formers across the country and uh, we work closely with a lot of mold makers as well as um, great vendors, uh, thermal form manufacturers like Sencorp. Um, we work together with Sencorp in troubleshooting um, problems with customers, um, different materials that come into play, um, questions about the, uh, the trim, um, and also work on new things and innovations as well. Not just local, but all, all around. around. Yeah, Actually, all over the world, that. I think. Uh, yeah. We might have some uh, customers uh, across the globe watching. Yeah. Um, the, the, the trim function is um, important. Uh, and I think maybe, John, you can uh, reiterate that. Right. So we're, we're looking at a uh, trim press here, a typical uh, ultra trim press for the uh, thermal formers. And we're all of our trim presses are uh, the four post uh, toggle top and bottom. And uh, whether it's the 75 ton press on the old 2500s up to the 115 ton and the 130 ton, we, uh, we have the uh, hydraulic bump cylinders on the bottom. That's uh, either through uh, an air over oil intensifier or a hydraulic pump system we were able to regulate that pressure to uh, deliver no more force on the trim tool that's necessary to cut the part and maximize the life of the blade. And I think uh, <clears throat> Chappell's uh, does a lot of different types of steel rule dies. Um, predominantly for the thermal forming area, um, there's not one cut and dry uh, steel rule die. Um, there's different uh, design options that you need to think about. So many questions come up when we have a new customer. Um, what is you know the part uh, function, um, clean room, uh, uh, medical part, food part, uh, what type of blade you're going to use? Um, it's not all one-stop shopping. Um, you need to have some design considerations um, with with trim tools. No, yeah, I appreciate the. Uh... The different blades and and the effort that Shopples has made to develop the best uh, best approach for every job and uh, they're looking at the big picture and I appreciate that. Yeah, thank you. Um, every every job is different um, and there is different uh, knives that can be utilized. Uh, we bend at our place from two point up to uh, four point knife um, and we typically for thermal forming recommend two point to three point. Um, we find that. Uh, the, the higher, the thicker the knife, um, not necessarily is more robust. Right. Uh, yeah. the, the thinner blade is harder and it's uh, the bending of the corners, it's uh, the integrity is much better. Right. Um, two point definitely, I mean, three point is normally used in a lot of applications, um, but even when you get into the thin, like the cosmetic um, type of, of customer, um, really thin gauge material, you're actually better off to go to a two point knife. Now, when I mentioned two point, um, some people might not know what that means. Um, so just to give you some insight to that, um, it, was all, it was all based on a, a pica in the printing industry. So the printing industry actually dictated a lot of the, the knife um, for uh, steel rule, um, and it, it still does to this day. Um, so two point actually is 0 0.028, three points 0.042. Um, we can get more answers to those questions as we uh, as we go further. Um, the 
the, the knife height is also critical. Um, so you've got the thickness of the knife, the height of the knife, um, what the height of the knife was actually is a consideration is the steel rule has a tolerance. Um, so the higher you get, you actually get, if you want to clear a part and you just want to go to a high knife because you don't want to do the buildup, um, you're actually not going to have as flat of a die. Um, you see these illustrations here as this is just the, the, the steel rule right out of the carton and the, and the, the height tolerance that, that you need to consider. Um, so we, you recommend to your customers keeping the knife height low? Yeah, I, I definitely agree with the, uh, the 937 wherever possible and machine out the backer plates and uh, that approach, it's going to be uh, a, a more robust uh, trim tool in the long run. And the, the, the steel rule um, with, with bending, it, CNC bending has come into our industry, I would say it's probably been around for about 20 years actually now. Mm -hmm. um, it's improved. Um, in the old days, we used to bend uh, with, with man, man pressure, uh, man-made pressure um, with hand benders. Um, so now we get nice consistent bends. So yes, it does help with controlling the, the height and, the, and the, the bends and the radiuses and the flatness of the die, um, even with the higher knife, but you're always still better to go um, with a lower, lower cut knife sure. um, if, if when possible. Yep. Having those, there we go, slide problems. <laughs> um, material, the uh, different, different material bases for dies can be wood, um, steel, uh, stainless steel, ray form, uh, we typically see a lot of wood dyes, but we also see a lot with rayform. Um, rayform is a very uh, uh, durable material. It can be re-knifed again and again, um, but the best advantage to rayform and thermoforming is the low moisture content of the material. Um, you can heat the rayform dye. Yeah, and it it's very, heat. very durable and uh, it serves its purpose very well for the heated trim tools. I mean, it is more costly, but it's an investment in, in getting, um, getting the heat to the edge of the blade. Also getting, um, you, you can use it in um, medical applications as well as food yeah, applications. Yeah, yeah for particulate. Um, we, shoppers will uh, clean the edges of the dyes if need be um, and, and sand off the burned edges um, just so that if you don't want that particulate in, in, the, um, in the clean room, um, we, we do that for some customers, it's on Quest. Um, but it's, it's definitely a good alternative. I mean, these other alternatives are, as you see on the left, um, the stainless, stainless based dyes um, and also aluminum based dyes. Um, stainless based dyes can be laser cut. Um, the nice thing about that is, is the, the temperature of the, uh, the dye can be higher. Um, <clears throat> different bevel angles. Uh, we see long bevel and center bevel and side bevel here on this slide. Um, center bevel is commonly used. Um, side bevel customers will use that to maybe get uh, closer to the edge of a part. Um, you can see where the cut edge is actually uh, moved over. Um, and then there's also a long bevel knife. Now, our experience with long bevel is it's typically used for um, displacing, helping to displace the material. So you use it with thicker materials. Sure. Um, we don't necessarily recommend long bevel to, it's not a sharper edge. It's not, it's, it's just because it's got a longer uh, um, bevel, it's just helping with the displacement of the material. I don't know what your thoughts are yeah, on long I, bevel. I feel it's, a, uh, it's an inferior cutting edge, but yes, for heavy or thick material, it has advantages, but I try to avoid it. I really, uh, try to steer to the center bevel wherever possible. It's more uh, readily available in center bevel and side yeah. bevel as well, mm -hmm. the edge, different edges and, and the bevels. Yeah. Quality um, is better, yeah. Right, so you, you, you can see um, center bevel, you actually have uh, typically uh, 53 degree or 42 degree, which is 42 degree is gonna be sharper. Um, we have an edge hardened 42 degree that you can utilize um, in your trim press. Yeah. And um, there's also um, a 30 degree, which is like really razor shot. Yeah. Um, but keep in mind, <laughs> one shot, and one shot and it's gone. <laughs> um, you're going to lose your edge. So yeah. you need to um, just be mindful of your 
um, operations and if you have proper setup, which I think we're going to cover in a little bit yeah, um, sure. with just going over uh, controlling that shut height. The, um, the other, another option too is side bevel versus center bevel. And I wanted to mention this too, because basically a customer that had side bevel used in the uh, center of a product and we swapped it over to um, a center bevel. And the reason we did that was it was failing. The internals were failing. And the reason they fail is, is this illustration here. I mean, it's a, it shows that when you're bending a tight radius, you're pushing the cut. So you're actually pushing the cut away from the center of the knife, which actually creates a high or a low spot. Sure. Yeah, you're going to vary the thick, the, the height of the blade, and you're not going to cut in some areas. Right. And, and I mean, at Chapels, we we can um, we can bend um, a straight corner, um, which is uh, brings us to joints. You know, you, you need to talk. We need to talk about joints too. Um, you want to if you have a complete rectangle um, with square corners, you'd rather have a joint on a straight. Than having it on, um, sure, uh, with 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 four square corners mm -hmm. and button miter up those joints. So we can bend a tight radius, um, but when you bend a tight radius with side bevel roll, it's going to exaggerate the um, the high and the low spots sure. on the center bevel. Yeah, yeah. and with a a two point on a, uh, a center bevel, you could go to what what's minimum radius can you go? Uh, we can go probably under a 30 second. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's amazing. And it, uh, that tight of a radius, I could imagine the edge could be compromised a little bit, but uh, yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. I mean, but you won't, it, it just makes for a longer, uh, you can add one, if you have just a complete rectangle and you have that joint in that, uh, in that flat area, then you can nicely miter up your um, your joint location. Yeah. And um, if you're using higher rule, we don't typically recommend um, welding um, mm -hmm. anything that's 937 unless you're going to a, like a very very shallow uh, die board which under half inch which we don't mm -hmm. typically recommend um, yeah. it keeps the cost down it keep, and the quality stays up having a 937 in the uh, in the standard thickness rate form it ends up uh, being a win in the long run but yeah. yeah the joints have to be just right if they're too tight if it's too tight they could they could not uh, flip over and that's a problem but yeah CNC yeah. uh, helps. Uh, yeah, so you're laser cutting. You're laser cutting the board. That's actually a good point when you say tight. Um, the laser cut boards actually have to be. You can't just throw it on the laser and, and press a button and you know hope for the best. It's it is a feel. Um, and if you have a tight board and a burned kerf, what we call kerf, um, you're going to have it uh, either banana up or or get um, you're going to get high spots and low spots with that. Mm -hmm. So the knife, all the board does. Is really is a template to hold the geometry. Sure. Yep. You know, Keep so that place. die kind of floats in there a little bit in, in a sense. Yep. Um, if you have a complete geometry that's that's closed, like a rectangle, um, it will settle in too as well. And it doesn't need to be um, tight. You need it to be a little bit loose and, and that knife, well supported, needs to settle into the uh, the backer plate. Sure. Yep. Uh, tolerance. This is my favorite subject. <laughs> sure, yeah. Uh, you, you you see tolerances as uh, well, part tolerance. Uh, yeah. Performing. Does that come up once in a while? Sure. Yeah. The uh, the end day, end game is the customer tolerance. The customer, the 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 user of the product. They they have a spec on their product, and uh, it's usually quite a bit looser than the trim tool tolerance. But uh, you've got shrinkage after trimming. You've got various processes so it it, it kind of adds up but definitely having a good quality trim tool that sets you up for success it's, it's definitely an improvement and and tolerance is a very big uh, subject for our medical tray customers sure. um, sometimes they need documents to support uh, that their part is is cut to a certain size um, yeah. so they will request tighter tolerances they may be pushed to the point where uh, their customer is asking for plus or minus a 30 second on a form part yeah. and it might be a big form part where, you know, you've got so many variables. Um, yeah. So trim tolerance is, uh, is critical. Um, but just keep in mind that when you, yes, you're laser cutting a board. Yes, you're CNC bending. So you're holding the knife, 
Um, but as you get into higher knives, you have that, remember the, the chart of the higher tolerance, that's just the tolerance on the blade height. So if that's varied, it's going to, it's going to sway the, um, the part tolerance. Sure, the cut size could vary. It's harder to control. Yeah. Right. Um, the geometry of the part, the, the part in that picture actually uh, shows a couple of radiuses bent in with the tab is. Um, now, if we've got a tight shoulder in there, you could struggle with the overall tolerance on a part like that. So the geometry plays a, a big factor mm. in um, steel rule when measuring the die. Um, at Shopples, we actually offer um, you know, reports and, and measuring um, capabilities, but we need to know um, what your what your ideal tolerance is, and we'll have that conversation um, so that we can know what it is before it leaves, and we'll measure it for you um, as as an added cost, though. So. <laughs> Maybe, sure. yeah. um, but it's it's definitely uh, a consideration, um, and you don't want to just boilerplate like you know our standard tolerance is plus or minus five <laughs> because why not just you know put it on the die maker. <laughs> We'll put it on the trim for us. Um, so the die construction um, also correlates with striker plates. Mm -hmm. So back in the old days, we had customers that would actually cut into aluminum. Yeah, sure. <laughs> What's the disadvantage? I mean, you're going to end up having a nice soft plate that you're cutting against. Yeah, it's, it's fine <laughs> if you're going to cut 100 pieces, but uh, for a decent production run, you need something much more... Uh, much more integrity yeah and uh we suggest a hardened steel cutting plate we we had, we also recommend the hardened steel on the backer plate behind the die but yes we uh we see the advantages and it is a uh, a change over the years that uh it went from aluminum to stainless steel and then uh the hardened steel offers so much more and the hardened steel is yes, it is more more expensive. A lot more, yeah. Um, and if people don't feel comfortable with their um, control on their on their their machine, um, you can go with a, a softer plate like a, a three hundred series stainless. Um, but cutting against a hard plate, you won't have that impression over time. So you can you can feel it. I mean, some customers will have operators that might want to just cut into the the striker plate like full force. Um, you, you don't want to do that. So um, part of, you know, again, maintenance, which hopefully we cover again at the end, if we have time, um, is, is running your hand over that, that sheet. Um, and also not using the same sheet for a different die cut. <laughs> That's that's been seen. <laughs> sure. Once the grooves are in there, you're you're done. You're going to have a yeah. uh, an interrupted cut. You're going to have uh, it's not going to be clean. You're going to have the uh, edges there to deal with. Right. 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 So you, you definitely want to make sure. I mean, if you can use hard ground plate, um, in the flatness. If if the press is flat and the die is flat, and you're cutting against a flat surface, and you're controlling your pressure and and shut height, then you you you'll you'll be fine. You're just you're just kind of kiss cutting it. Yeah. We, uh, we have the uh, master tooling that we put in the presses, the uh, build-up plates. We're, we're very careful on the, the, the uh, flattened parallel of it, all of that. And uh, we, we try to set our customers up for success to be as flat as possible and uh, just helps with uh, make ready afterwards as far as setting up on each job. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Um, now, you mentioned backer plates too. Yeah. Um, I've seen convoluted build-ups for you know, not properly supporting supporting sure. the dies. Um, yeah. Backer plates are a critical part of the buildup. Um, backing up to a hard plate is, is ideal. Um, if you have a little bit of given the machine, I don't know if you've experienced this, but we've seen customers, they might feel more comfortable with just backing it with a 300 series stainless so that there's a little more give to it. You do have to keep with the maintenance and check that backer plate um, to make sure it's properly supporting it. Um, and yeah, it will it will groove a uh, soft plate. The back of the blade will uh, wear into it. Mm -hmm. And here we're, we're we're encouraging our customers to float the dies, and we want that surface to be smooth. We don't want any interruptions because that could translate to a, a poor cut quality. Mm -hmm. And and the buildups on the besides the backer plate. So you're you're supporting. We've, I've I've seen I've seen um, a shim tape band supports. I mean this is. I know that not everybody, I'm sure anybody that's watching never ever did anything like that. Um, we've seen, uh, you know, you reusing uh, 
softer plates like a 300 series stainless as a backer plate for multiple geometries mm. um, where you're going to have like high to high and low spots created. Mm. Um, the, uh, the other thing is, is the buildup of the tool. Um, you can use wood, which is for, for clearance of the part. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, you see in the, the, the slide here, you've got aluminum based um, buildups, which we typically recommend cast. Yeah, we recommend a, a cast aluminum plate and we'll take a chip on this each side to make it nice and flat. We, it's, it's worth the, uh, the investment. Unfortunately, it's more cost, but the, the challenges with make ready as that, uh, as that job runs, I, I think it's, uh, the advantages outweigh the risks. The, um, so we, we typically recommend aluminum cast as well. Um, if you're, you know, you've got a long running job, um, you can do it with wood. Um, there's variables with Rayform we found um, with our experience. So we don't typically recommend Rayform as a, as a backup. So wood's gonna um, actually have a little more spongy effect to it. Um, yeah. So that's a little safer bet, but there's actually a thickness tolerance industry for uh, Rayform. And because it's so durable and doesn't have the give and you're not you know, mm. um, skimming it, um, then you're, you, you might have an issue with an un, um, a high, a high die sure. where you're thinking and you're at a certain height and you're not. Yeah. And the, uh, the way it's used in the, in the, in the illustrations here, the, uh, the blade is captured by the reform and that's, it's so well suited for that purpose. Mm -hmm. It's great for re, re knifing. And, um, and I think we're going to, we're going to touch on, um, the heated dies too, as well. Um, but floating, floating dies, you mentioned you like to float. Yeah. Why, why, why would you recommend floating? Well, again, it's setup time. We want to see the machine up and running as quickly as possible. And, you know, the industry demands a tight tolerance on the, the die cut registration to the form part. So uh, if possible, let's have the tool do the locating. Let's take the, uh, take the risks off of the operator setting up the job, have a little uh, leeway. It just gets the machine up and running all the, all the quicker. And uh, yeah, I like to uh, float on the on the part. I like to pick up the geometry of the part we're actually locating. Uh, I like to uh, keep the trim tool as light as possible so it can be uh, moved around. But uh, yeah, we're a fan of uh, floating. Uh, the only time we don't float our dies is uh, when we uh, we bolt them solid for our uh, index test test on our uh, thermal forms. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the um. The floating, and one, one thing that comes to mind too is, is we also have to know whether or not it's a female mold or a male mold, um, and typically um, whether or not the dies are trimming on the top or the bottom would dictate that, I'm, I'm sure. Um, mm -hmm. But what do you typically like to see on the trim? Well, we prefer to have the die on the top. We'll definitely go to that approach wherever possible. But if the geometry of the product won't let us, then we can easily put the, the trim tool on the bottom. With our master tooling, we have uh, some plates that can uh, come out and a, uh, a thinner plate with a sterile die on the bottom will uh, we'll do the job and uh, works out well. We, we generally don't heat the, the lower anvil, but um, the... Uh, do you guys have that as an option sometimes or is that... Yeah, there's a select few that like to have a, a lower heated uh, package on the trim press and uh, we'll do that when, uh, when it's asked and... Uh, we can do that. It gets a little uh, cumbersome with the uh, sheet width when the tool width changes. That that heated plate has to come out, and that's where it gets a little bit of a challenge. Okay. Um, and, and floating dies. The options you see here are um, you know male locators. Um, also, uh, you know you can just register the clear the part and um, use the ray form or the uh, the wood cutout yep. to to locate. Um, also, uh, as a as a note, we we do also a lot of dies that have um, retainer plates where the dies actually float within that retainer. It's the bottom right picture. Um, you can use we, we typically use aluminum, um, thin gauge aluminum, just yep. because it's lightweight. Um, we have customers that might want to use stainless because they've got gorillas working for them, you know. So, um, but it it typically we use a, a aluminum thin gauge, um, and uh, the nice thing about it was is what we see with is what polypropylene. Sure. Being able to predict yeah. the shrink of yeah. polypropylene can vary. 
Yeah. And um, I see polypropylene vary from uh, day to night when the plant temperature changes or, or if a, a roll is stored out in a cold area. Yeah, there's, uh, there's challenges with polypropylene and having a little more float could uh, make all the difference. Now, why would you see a difference in the day to night? Well, the amount of heat energy you've got to put into the film uh, can change. You have your set points in your thermoformer and then you change from roll to roll. You have a, a roll that's uh, normalized in the uh, in the plant, and then you if a if a roll comes in colder, it's going to react differently through the heater. Okay. Um, but, uh, but yeah, you're floating with the uh, that capture plate, and that's uh, that's attached to a plate below it. Right. That's right. Good. We have the shoulder um, basically standoffs. Yep. Um, for different knife heights. Mm -hmm. um, but the nice thing is, is you could order multiple, um, maybe one or two or three different um, center to centers on the uh, retainer plate yep. so that you can help you find that uh, spot. You always want to start with your optimum uh, yep. prediction. Sure. Um, but if you need to change it over or, or adjust, um, it's a quick change. It's just a plate that yep. can be replaced. Great. That, um, <clears throat> So floating dies options, you know, this is this is just a few more options. Another thing to mention too is, and I know this is kind of maybe silly, but lo locators. Um, you see the bottom left corner, you see locators. You don't necessarily need to have a locator on every single cavity. You can add the locators um, to maybe the four corners, uh, a couple in the middle, and it can find its way that way. It's yeah. enough. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the um, other thing too is, is the geometry of the part. Um, you can locate uh, with, well, actually, I think it's on the, the last screen. Yeah, the, um, the cone locators, which I don't think it's on there. Oh yeah, the top top right, yeah. um, the cone locators. This, this actual customer actually had some geometry to that part um, where they could fit it into the, to the side so there was room. Right. Um, but we use just standard punches you yeah. grind the height down and you actually we have some customers that will actually will grind the cut height and because they've got it figured for um matching the um the angle of the comb yep um sure. so just stock punches um put in there make yeah. it standardized keep it simple yeah, um yeah you know yeah when you have the geometry that they can fit in there it's uh that's great yeah you you, you prefer to locate on the actual product but many times you can't mm -hmm. and uh the cone locators, sometimes they add uh, additional waste in the thermoformer in the sheet, but uh, geometry like that, they fit in without uh, adding any, uh, any waste. Yeah, you don't have to line them up in a quadrant either. So geometry like that, you can actually uh, get a little creative with the outside shape yeah. of the dies too. You know, there was some contour to that particular one. Yeah. Um, the other thing too is the floating shoulder bolts. Um, the the floats on the bottom right, um, we actually went on the inside. I know that sounds maybe people don't think that actually it's on the left too, um, but you have room in there if you need to, um, you need to find some real estate to put the, uh, the shoulder bolts in. Yep, yep, that um, works. It's great. But speaking of real estate, <laughs> <laughs> um, the, uh, the, the knife and common cuts, um, we don't really have a slide for that, but um, Common cuts are uh, something that die makers don't really like too much. Right. Um, how? What is your usual recommendation for? A, we we call it a gutter spacing between cavities, or yeah, we'd like to see a half an inch as far as trimming. A lot of times, it's the forming geometry and the design of the form tool that ends up being a limiting factor. But yeah, we'd like to see a half an inch between cuts. Um, yeah, we've done many jobs that we've gone down to three eighths or somewhere in that range. But uh, the thinner you go, the, the weaker the web is and the greater chance of, of snapping that web further downstream. Mm -hmm. And yeah, the common cut is ideal because there's no waste, but yeah, there's, there's risks and challenges associated with that. But uh, yeah, it's a trade-off. And uh, the other thing you got is uh, fewer linear inches of trim. So you've got a uh, potential of more up, but uh, there are some risks. There's, there's definitely risks with joints because we don't like them. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, it's steel rule, it comes off a coil. So you're, you're bending, you're bending the geometry. Um, it, we had a uh, customer that was running a common, common knife lid 
um, and it actually um, married up nicely and the tabs were opposite each other, um, but it ran great. Um, but the blending of those joints um, is, is crucial. And when you're, you're, the optimum place to put a joint is on a straight. Yeah. Um, because with steel rule, um, the CNC bending does miters. So with the, with the benders, where we're bending the knife, we're sometimes nicking, which we will probably cover later. Um, and we're also um, putting that miter in. And what a miter is, is it's actually like a, a little uh, cutoff that actually marries up to the adjacent um, knife. Yeah. And you want that to be nice and smooth in the joint. And if you can put it in a straight area, um, it will help do, it, it'll, it'll help keep it straight. Sure. Um, yeah. And it'll, it'll make a nice thing. But that back to that customer, what happened with them was, is it ran fine the first time, um, but it was a blended radius, which was great. But over time, buildup of material. But what happened was, is it failed when they switched the material to a thicker, different type of material. Mm. And it, what happens is, is the, the buildup of the material gets in that joint and that tight area and that radius, that, that tiny seam, and it'll actually pull apart the sure. joint. Swell it open, yeah. yeah. And then you've got a, a not what we call a natural nick becomes a big honky nick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that happens unfortunately. Yeah. So common knife yeah. avoid. I know you save on material, but in the long run, um, it, it it's it's probably not profitable yeah, um, if you're going to struggle with it. It's a risk, yeah. That, yeah, you, yeah, you pay for it every day, but uh, yeah, it's. And I, I I I'm liking the fact that you guys actually leave a half inch. Yeah. On the, I recommend half inch three eighths because we get asked that question and we're pushed to quarter inch typically in between in between knives is a comfortable area to give that support. Um, you can see in the bottom left slide actually yeah the bottom left slide is probably the best illustration. Um, probably about a quarter inch of a uh, of board. So mm -hmm. that board is a template. It's holding it, but it's also you don't want that to not support that side of that knife yeah it gets so weak it'll blast out right yeah right but the, yeah quarter of an inch is uh it's pretty thin there's not much holding the tool together and uh then you you end up having a one-piece tool so your shrinkage has to be just right so it'll be harder to control your shrinkage and things like that if the uh if the sheet is snug in the trim in the trim press it's going to it's going to put some tension on the material and it may not uh, shrink as you plan so now your uh, your your registrations off a touch mm -hmm. but uh, yeah, yeah. We, we try to avoid common cut and uh, when customers know what they're doing and they have a lot of years of experience yeah they may want to be a little more aggressive and go less but uh, as i said in the beginning most of the time it's the it's the forming geometry the mold geometry the, the cooling in the mold that uh, sets that spacing Mm -hmm. um, the um, another clearance area is a well, we'll just address this slide because we kind of combed over the topic. You had mentioned uh, parts, maybe uh, capturing the part in the board. Um, you can mill the pockets down too, and we talked about integrity of the of the die. Um, this helps the integrity of the die. So if you're holding a knife in that template, um, if you mill uh, clearance away from the board on the inside. Um, you can still keep some of the integrity. I believe in the bottom picture, it shows there's a little bit of a lip of material. Um, mm -hmm. So we're able to hold the knife a little bit better, which helps with your tolerance, which helps with your flatness. Um, Looks like uh, rack holes on here. You've got some uh, hang tab holes there that and rubber eject in those blades. And yes. They're yes. a challenge to yeah. keep them from- uh, That can close high spots. That's another yeah. thing too, is, is going with a high knife with a two inch high um, hang hole or, um, punch it, you'll see tight geometry like that cause the problem in the, in the trim press. Sure. Um, you'll see it on the cut plate yeah. um, and the high spots in the, in the die. Mm. Um, heated dies, you guys recommend them usually or? Yeah, we, we encourage the, uh, the heated trim. Uh, we have a, a buildup that we offer in the, in the trim press and uh, cartridge heaters that will heat up the station and uh, it's all controlled through the machine. It's, it's stored in the uh, tool file so they can uh, go back and see what they rented at. And uh, it's a nice way to have the machine at uniform temperature. And uh, you put your trim tool in, you, you get the heat warming up. And then when your, uh, your form tool is in, you, your trim tool is basically at temperature and uh, you're good to go. 
What do you typically recommend for a heat temperature? Because this goes back and forth with our customers a lot. Yeah, <laughs> I I usually say 250. I, okay. You know, some people go as low as 150, and I know our machine is limited to 400. And uh, that that temperature, you're uh, you're probably not using a steel wool dye. I, I don't know, but uh, we limit it just so we don't uh, do any damage. And we, we get that question asked a lot because the um, the heat on the dye, you know, hotter is better, and it it might not be um, have to be that hot. We typically recommend uh, 275, 250. Um, and the reason we do that is a lot of our customers will use uh, the Rayform material, yeah. um, and it's it's manufactured at 300 degrees. It's compressed um, resin and fiberboard that's uh, compressed at, mm. and, and made at 300 degrees. So you might see delamination at that point. Sure. But we also um, would right out of the gate recommend customers getting a heat gun to see what the knife, the heat is at the edge of the tip of the blade. That's true. Yeah, uh, we we have a uh, temperature controller in the press on the on the heated platen, but yeah, down at the tip of the blade is going to be less. Plus, uh, if the dies are floating, they're hanging down a little bit. The heat transfer is not that good, so uh, that's an excellent point. And I mean, you, you're going to lose it after you're going to lose a little bit of heat from yeah. that. You're going to lose heat um, with with higher higher knife as well. Um, yeah. With uh, you know, you're not going to have that insulation. Yeah. Um, so, and the other thing with heated dyes is um, it, it, we recommend it. And I don't know if a lot of your customers opt to do the heated platen or if Quite they, a few, yeah. Okay, yeah. okay. So some, uh, some don't, and uh, I think some people, they, uh, they make their own, but, uh, but yeah, we generally encourage it. Okay. Sometimes yeah. we'll have heat on the top, and I think I mentioned on the bottom as well, but uh, we encourage a heated platen for the top. And the... Um, the, the knives themselves, um, we, we actually did a test at our place um, with 52 degree, 42 degree, and 30 degree. Um, 30 degree is not usually recommended. Um, it's very fragile. If you have great operators and a great control over your machine, um, you won't lose your edge on your, on your bevel. Um, but you can see here in the charts um, what happens when you in introduce heat to your blades um, by introducing you know, the heat of 275 to the heated platen, you're actually reducing the amount of tonnage that's required to, to cut. Um, so when you're trying to max out layout, so you've got a difficult geometry, um, a heated blade will help you trim the part cleanly, sure. reducing angel hair um, and, 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 and basically reducing tonnage as well. Yeah. On our machines, we have a uh, dual pressure cutting that we're able to toggle in activate our hydraulic at a low pressure so it, it gives it a soak time so that blade can sit there in the, in the material, soften, and then we hit it at the very end of the cycle with high pressure so we're cutting through. And that makes a difference as far as cutting like, uh, like, like a knife and butter, you know? That's what you call like a dwell time, right? It just sits yep. on the, it's yep. just sits there and then it pops through. Yep. And it doesn't pop all the way to the cut plate. It just, <laughs> <laughs> it just fractures the material the rest of the way. Yeah. Um, so you let that blade sit there. So heat is 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 definitely improvement sure. to to cutting. So if you yeah. can add it into your your yeah. trim, um, yeah. it, it's definitely recommended. Yeah, nice chart. Yeah. Um, nice dye. <laughs> yeah, nice dye. <laughs> the um, time for a reroll. So we're gonna we're gonna hop into maintenance now. Um, this is probably, I'm hoping, is an exaggerated uh, time for a reroll. Um, but maintenance procedures uh, is, is critical. Um, we have CNC bending now. So the beauty of that is the once we have the, the file to create the dive, maybe the 20 up dive that we created for you, um, we can repeat the cavities of knife and we can, we can ship um, an extra set of cavities to you. Now, do we want the phone call at four o'clock to ship out that same day? <laughs> Not really. <laughs> um, so a little preventive, preventive maintenance um, mm -hmm. by checking the tools um, when they come off of the, the machine um, is, is definitely a plus. Mm -hmm. It saves time, it saves money, you know, it saves downtime. Um, and we can, you know, I think, do you typically recommend to your customers to order extra cavities or order extra dyes? Yeah, I, I encourage them to have an extra set of trim dyes. And then, so if there's an issue, you've got to take the dyes out, 
the machine is down. We want to get the machine up and going uh, as quick as possible. So I would, we would say, put in another set of dies. And while that's running the, that set, the initial set, you would uh, have those re-knifed, whether you re-knife them yourself or have Sharples do it. But uh, yeah, we would say, get the machine back up and running because it, it's a little bit of work to pull that blade out and put new in, mm -hmm. but it definitely can be done. Yeah, I mean, it can be done and uh, having the extra cavities. The nice thing, again, about the CNC bending is um, we can also create a nick in the part yeah. for part progression. Yeah. Um, or if it's also, uh, uh, we do a lot of um, tamper evident um, tear seals, sure. uh, things like that. Yeah. Um, we, we let our customers go hog wild and creating all kinds of different nicked <laughs> patterns. Um, we have four, uh, you can, you can create four different, uh, use four different nick sizes, um, in one run. So, um, if you have a, a design, the, the great thing about that is I probably should have went with this with the construction, but, um, if you have a nicking pattern that you want to have a tear strip for, um, you can do prototypes with two to three different styles. Maybe, um, we recall that file, ABC, whatever it is. And um, we can repeat it. So repeatability. Sure. Um, the pitch because, and the size of the nick. That's great. Right. And, and, and then for part progression, you have your time for a reroll. You've got your extra cavities that John recommends ordering or dies. And um, you've got your operators that already, they don't have to nick. They actually are come in pre-nicked and you put them in the dies and you, you're setting up the same thing. So you're getting the same results yeah. from the trim. Yeah, let's avoid the uh, garage door nicks that uh, have to be put in the machine. Have yeah, the nicks done up no front. screwdrivers yeah. in the machines yeah. or chisels or anything like that. Allen screws, yeah. Yeah, I mean there are there are different different techniques with nicking. Um, that's a whole topic for another time, I think. Sure. Um, but, but yeah, having those small nicks, it's incredible how consistent and how how nice they work out. And and the the rule of thumb with nicking too is we've learned is because um, we do also work with uh, folding carton manufacturers. Yep. Typically the rule of thumb in paper is to use the nick size that is the thickness of the board that they're cutting. Mm. We don't yeah. find that with thermoform. Sure. We find smaller, thinner, you know, eight thousandths to ten thousandths nicks are usually um, fine. Yeah. You yeah. can always make them a little bit bigger if you had to. Right. Um, and you can adjust for that. Um, mm. Depends on the material and the thickness of the material, but yeah. It's not necessarily, if you're cutting um, O20 material, yeah. it doesn't necessarily mean you need an O20 neck. Sure. Um, Start so, smaller and it go bigger if you really have to. Yeah. And inf information um, as part of maintenance is another, uh, another thing too that we find uh, with our, our system, we can recall a job, come up and, and know what size we nicked it, reproduce it, um, and if you have a change to that, um, please let us know because we need to know that so that we, we can repeat that order again. Sure. Um, you miss with, with maintenance, I guess we're, we're kind of getting into maintenance a little bit. Um, the information on, on your system, do you have, what it kind of recall, can you call back a job on? They can tell how many cycles a, a job is run. They can, they can monitor that with the, uh, the control system on the machine. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, number of cycles, that's that's, uh, that's the magic number. And, and it's important to, to watch the data, watch what you're running and learn from it. Information not only helps is how many cycles, what you're running, the cut pressure, the cut pressure at the beginning, the cut pressure when the trim tool wears, you know, just kind of keep an eye on those things. Mm -hmm. um, the, the cut pressure too is, uh, the thing I want to mention is that template that we talked about with the right form and the wood, the knife has to settle in too. So yeah. as you cycle through, um, I don't know how many cycles, maybe one or two or three, um, that the, the knife needs to kind of settle into its place so that it's properly flat. That doesn't mean you juice it up <laughs> and crank up the pressure. <laughs> right, hit a very low pressure in the beginning. Yeah. Slowly increase it, yes. And, and slowly increase it. You might yeah. need, you might see not only just wear, but just letting the die settle into sure. its place. Sure, see some inconsistencies in the beginning, yeah. Right, right. And uh, cut paper, yeah. That's, uh, yeah, that's, that's start that's, off that approach. Yeah, so uh, what we have some customers will actually do 
Um, and I know it's, it's, it's a little cumbersome because you got to stop and you're not going right to the material. But if you can cut through thin paper, like um, make ready material at three, four, four or five thousandths material, if you're cutting through that and just getting through, that means you're, you know, you know you're, where you're at, you can tell where your high and your low spots are, where your problem areas are. Um, and and that, will, that will definitely help as well. Um, that uh, brings us to, oh, cavities and knife. Well, while we're on the subject, we're not. <laughs> um, we actually, since CNC bending, um, we sell a lot of cavities and knife, and not because people are damaging everything. Um, it's just part of the maintenance program. Sure. So um, we can, uh, this is this actually, this illustration and these simple tools, um, we can make you a die maker too, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> it, if we send you a consistent um, die blade, we usually, we usually burn a test board as you see here and we'll check the cavities um, to make sure the fit's right, that nothing changed. Um, and then we can send out those extra 20 cavities of knife pre-nicked and you can make it part of your maintenance program. Um, but you can, you know, you can re-knife this way. Um, there's other, a couple other alternatives if people don't feel safe with this. Um, you can also send the, the dies back for a re-knife as well. Um, heat tape, that's part of maintenance. We, we, we talked about heat, but how do you feel about heat tape, John? Yeah. <laughs> it's hard to, uh, it's hard to deal with. It is a, uh, it is a challenge. I avoid that at, at just about all costs. It's, uh, it has an advantages, you know, you're heating only where the blade is, but uh, it's, it's a challenge yeah. to adhere it, to re-knife. It's got some, uh, there's some serious costs associated with it, but uh, yeah. It gets, it gets the heat to the right to the tip, like you said, and, and, and the maintenance on it is, um, is cumbersome. Um, you have to not only create the cavity, but you also have to um, re, re put the heat tape on. Um, there's drying time, um, and if you have a die that gets smashed, then you've got you've got downtime. Um, so it's not optimal. The other thing I like to mention to customers too is uh, we just preached about low knife and keeping the die flat and keeping it at nine thirty seven. With heat tape, you have to go to a higher knife. Sure. Um, you it's available in half inch and one inch thick. So you actually have to have a higher knife, um, like a, maybe the minimum is inch and a quarter um, to go up to on the heat tape. Um, so it's, 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 a, it's a cost um, and it's a trade-off, um, but some customers like it. If they don't have a heated platen, um, call Sencorp and buy one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> this, won't be, uh, this can't be controlled in our Sencorp heated trim package. This would require a separate control or something else. Do you also offer the heat, like do people plug into the machines? Like, do they? Sometimes they'll ask for a 110 volt outlet or something, but okay. yeah, I don't know exactly what they're doing. But yeah, my experience has been that it's just a, a, a real stat. It's not a precise temperature. And I suppose with the heat gun, you can monitor it. You'd have to keep watching it. But yeah, it's not anything precise. And uh, yeah, we, I mean, we, 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 when we wire these up, um, we actually, like to have some feedback from the customers to where the plug's gonna go. Um, mm -hmm. And also if they wanna have it wired a certain way so that maybe they, they can regulate and know if the cavity is, um, is not heated. Mm -hmm. um, so there is some forethought and some mapping that needs to take place with that as well. That might be uh, DC voltage. I'm not even sure, but uh, anyway. Oh. Um, we talked about press leveling and cutting with paper. Um, the one thing that uh, you see here is, is press leveling. I, I have that map. I kind of kind of stole it from uh, Paperboard. Um, they do that with uh, platen presses um, where they want to see where the high and the low spots are. The idea is, is to keep that make ready sheet um, available so you can kind of overlay it and know where you're going to have your problems. So you're actually predicting where your high and low spots are in your machine. Sure. Um, but I think the most important thing is to keep up with your maintenance on the master tooling. Yeah, the, 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 the condition of the press and all the master tooling. Over time, these plates, if they come in and out, they could get uh, damaged with some, some uh, scratches or edges in them that could affect things. And yeah, they need to be uh, inspected and make sure that everything is flat. And yeah, that's a good telltale to uh, see if uh, something's going on. 
you, I mean, as we, we have some customers with multiple machines and they can actually predict which job is going to run better on, on certain, on certain presses. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. The, the die you see to the right was a conjunction. Uh, we, we worked with a testing guy with um, Sencorp um, to measure the amount of tonnage needed. Um, you have some recommendations on tonnage, right? Yeah, we have a chart for uh, cutting that we, we adhere to. Uh, we feel, yeah, it, it, it's very conservative, especially on thin gauge where, yeah, with a sharp die, you could cut quite a bit more, but uh, as the blade, uh, uh, wears or anything happens, you need to go up on pressure. We don't want you to overexert the machine or run out of pressure. But yeah, we did do some testing, and yeah, some of the thicker gauges, uh, PET, it's uh, it's hard to cut. That those pressures are high, but the thin material, it uh, it cuts a little bit easier. And uh, yeah, there may be cases. I, I would say, uh, watch your your own jobs. Watch the hy the hydraulic pressure of a. Uh, a job you're running to decide if you want to be more aggressive in the future. But yeah, the, the bottom line is uh, you've only got so much hydraulic pressure and you can't go beyond that. So we, we don't want you to uh, run out and have trouble running a job. Yeah, the, um, the, the tonnage on the machine, we get that asked a lot, how much, how many, and not even just in thermal forming, it's across the board. I mean, cutting sure. parts, um, how many uh, up can I run this job so that I can maximize the yield? Yeah. Um, but it's it's a consideration. Geometry is a consideration. Yeah. Um, getting one more row could mean getting the job or not getting the job. And mm -hmm. yeah, we understand that. We want to, uh, you know, we want to see you get the job. So uh, it's, but I uh, think information is, is definitely your track record and understanding your machines, right. understanding um, what your material, what your experience is with the material right. um, and how, uh, how much you can push. Right. Um, but again, what John mentioned is as over time, you need to keep an eye on, on where of the tool, um, where, whether or not you've got, um, you can see on the top right, You've got some, you, you lose your edge of that, that cut and it's not going to cut properly. You're going to end up with angel hair. So you need to preserve the edge of the knife. And also when you take it off the machine, we can't really reiterate enough that um, you need to reblade the die. Yeah. You know? And yeah, when that blade wears down, it, it kind of mushrooms out and you can take your nail and you can feel an edge. You can feel where it's uh, rolled over a touch. And uh, the side bevel is it is uh, very apparent, but the uh, center bevel a little hard to tell. But uh, it's definitely uh, sometimes you can see some white uh, ghosting too, and yeah. some 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 wear in that. Yeah. Um, like like you said, running running his nail over it just to see. Um, but that's that's definitely part, and and maybe we've had some very smart customers that make it part of their procedure to yeah. reblade before they put the die back in storage because you're pulling the tooling. Yeah, and you you got the job, and you're setting it up, and then you realize, uh oh. <laughs> yeah, once the job is in the machine, you need to be making parts. Right? Yeah, and we understand that. We want you to get running. So definitely, uh, check your uh, check your machines. Um, oh, well, we could talk about this a little bit, I guess. <laughs> this is uh, nicking um, nicking. So we were actually talking about um, the. Uh, part progression. And we, we talked about nicking the, the dies and we have the ability to repeat the nicks. Um, we have some customers that are actually, uh, we've done some testing with this as well, um, where we're nicking the cut plate. Um, yeah. It's not optimal. It's not optimal. And we don't have the magic numbers for you. So you kind of have to play with it. Yeah. Um, but we can mill um, a hard plate, um, a very fine uh, nick, and if you're floating a die, um, you don't necessarily have to have a small nick. You could actually, you know, just extend that 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 out a little bit further. I have a slot, yeah. I yeah, can, I can see that. And um, what you find when you have success with nicking the plate um, is it's less of an interruption than it is when you actually um, nick on top of the die. Hmm. Yep. Um, I've only done it with foam, and that was years ago, but. Uh... It's interesting. It'd be uh, something to try. Yeah, I mean, we we have the ability to mill the plates. Um, we unfortunately we don't have the ability to run the jobs. So different sure. materials uh, are gonna are gonna. Uh, we can't predict what they're gonna do. Um, we have a little testing machine that we can 
give you a, an idea of what sizes maybe are going to work. Um, but that, um, that is up to you. You can also nick one side of the plate and have it flat on the other side. Sure. Have the cavities of knife ready to go with nicks, and then you're up and running too with that. Um, but with nicks, this the one thing that's critical with our industry is it's, it's evolving to robotics. <laughs> sure. So now repeatability yeah. is um, yeah automation. You know yeah. automation. Yeah. And you guys offer. Um, yeah, we uh, will have an offload system that we can offer with our machines. And yeah, it's uh, very uh, well received and uh, it's it's a big part of the future. It definitely uh, is the way to go. And yeah, the NIC size is critical there. Uh, we, uh, we have some customers that are comfortable with that end of arm tool with the vacuum cups, they can break the NICs. And we have, uh, they've spent a long time developing and getting comfortable with it, but uh, generally we say they should have a um, a, a tool, a, a, support. a lower pusher, and a and a, a thing to a plate to support the web. Yeah, and uh, it's so easy to uh, to snap that web, and, uh, and then you're done. So, uh, and you can easily do that with a you know a plate of some type, yep. or even I've seen we've seen wood where yep. you're supporting the web yep. to help push it through, and then some maybe some simple. Um, male pushers to help support that part exactly. so that when the suction cup comes down it's yeah. actually on to yeah. we'll, we'll put some end of arm tools together you also the other thing too is, is some people just directly put the suction cups on the the plate um you this great options in the um, robotics or field i don't know if it's suction cups um there's a lot of manufacturers out there you can get a book this thick of different variable suction cups <laughs> we stock a few not all of them yeah, yeah, yeah. um the um it's amazing how well they work with uh, various geometry. You know, it doesn't have to be a flat surface. And, yeah, uh, they do well. Yeah. yeah. So the um, but the the level we can you can also use a level compensator too, sure. yeah. which helps to kind of compensate for whatever that inconsistency yeah. is. Yeah. And you attach that to your suction cup. Yeah. Um, we can assemble some of those tools with you yeah. know with uh, working with our customers. Yeah. Um, and, but it all has to be consistent. Um. And there has to be some proper thought in the beginning of the design as well. Yeah. You know, where, where are we going to pick this from? Um, where are we going to nick? Um, sure. that, there has to be some, some forethought to that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we uh, really appreciate you guys sitting in on this. <laughs> this is the first for John and I. I think it's first for him. I don't know. It's first time for me doing a, a live webinar. Yeah. But, um, it's excellent to get some. Uh... Get some information out there, and I look forward to some feedback back. And uh, you know, any yeah. uh, questions? It's uh, yeah. Feel free to ask ask questions, send them yeah. along, yeah. and um, we'll we'll help answer you as best we can. Um, yeah. You know, knowledge is power. Yeah. And Sharples does a great job with the uh, the trim tools. Uh, don't hesitate to uh, reach out to them. They'll uh, take good care of you. Thank you very much, John. Yeah. Appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. And uh, Sandcorp's a great vendor to work with. <laughs> Great work, Bender. Yeah. Um, the customized tooling, yeah. customized machines, um, yeah. which can drive you crazy as a die maker, but yes. <laughs> it, it's it's good. Yeah. Um, so thank you very much for having us. Yeah. We really appreciate it.